Good afternoon to all of you. So as Steve talked today, and as you know, the focus of really our two days here has been around the, the Syrian crisis, you know, World Vision as an organization um, is very happy to be engaged in this work, right? And so when you look at the organization and you, and you read World Vision, building a better world for children, or our vision for every child, life in all its fullness, our prayer for every heart, the will to make it so. Um, the Syrian crisis is at the forefront and at the center of what we're doing in World Vision. Um, a lot of our energy and mobilization and resources uh, are heading towards the Syrian crisis. Uh, my role in the organization is to lead our child protection and our education work globally. And so as the Syrian crisis has become the forefront of, of what we're working in, and a large, largely due to the media coverage that it's gotten, um, I lead a team of people who are continuing to focus on those things that were covered by the media over the past few years, whether it's Nepal or whether it's the refugee crisis that we had at our southern border with children coming from Latin America, or whether it's um, the Bangladesh garment factory fire that brought child labor to the forefront, um, or whether it's um, those types of issues that around the world are really impacting the lives of children. That's where I continue to focus in addition to the Syrian crisis. And so what I thought I'd do today is just to give you, to take a step back from the Syrian crisis and give you a little bit more of an understanding of how World Vision addresses these issues that are impacting children around the world. Um, and it's not just those, those media ones, it's, it's trafficking in Cambodia. It's sacrifice, child sacrifice in Uganda. It's child soldiers in the DRC or Myanmar. It's female cutting and and early marriage in Kenya and Mozambique. And it's female infanticide in places like Armenia. And so children are at risk at harm, of harm and violence all over the world. And so we talk about this from the lens of child protection. So we all know what child protection is, but re what really is child protection, right? So the definition of child protection is any and all measures that are taken to prevent or respond to all forms of violence, abuse, exploitation, and neglect affecting children around the world. Again, any and all measures taken to prevent or respond to all forms of violence, abuse, exploitation, and neglect to children around the world. The, the, the term that I, and the way I usually like to talk about it when I'm having conversations like this, especially conversations with church folk, is it's all the bad things that happen to children, all the evil that happens to children, and really God's hand against that evil to protect those children and to maintain and protect their childhoods. And so we are working in a lot of different ways around the world, and what World Vision has determined is the best way to work is from the perspective of prevention, right? So if you visualize with me an analogy that several of us in this work do, and, and, and even the broader work of World Vision do, is um, you, you imagine this river. You're standing at the bottom of the river, and flowing down the river are a bunch of children. Some of them are already dead. Some of them are grasping onto logs and fighting for breath. Um, but all of them are coming down, and you can see that there's some form of trauma to all the children floating down the river. And so there's a mass of people that have come to the river, and they're hauling children out. And some of them have nets, and some of them have boats, and some of them have rope, and some of them are triaging on the shore, and we're trying to save these children. For whatever reason, they're coming down, and they have different issues that have impacted their lives and have and placed them in the river. And so what we've decided, along with some other organization and key partners around the world, is let's go upstream and figure out why children are falling in the river. And so through preventative measures, um, sticking with this river analogy, we go upstream and we find out that there's no lifeguard on duty. The banks are eroded. The bridge is broken. The rocks and, and, and the, and the a, um, current is very strong, so maybe there should be a no swimming sign there. But you look at all these different interventions that can happen upstream to prevent children from coming down the river. And so that's the position that World Vision has put themselves in is to not only respond to and restore children as they come out, and we do a lot of activities about that, but really going upstream in partnership with third-party organizations, other, other NGOs, and community members themselves to strengthen the system that's there to protect children. The way that we approach child protection, system strengthening. So here in the United States, we have a child protection system, just like we have a health system and an education system. 
It's made up of formal and informal actors who have the mandate to protect or educate or provide good health for families and children. It's the same in other places. The problem is, oftentimes those systems are broken. Oftentimes, especially for the children who are the most vulnerable, who don't, maybe don't have access to those systems, they're broken. And the other thing is, they can easily be corrupted. Police officers can be paid off, judges can be paid off. Um, child sex and labor trafficking alone is a $130 billion industry. So we go back to that, that talk about evil, right? There's money to be made on the exploitation and the harm and the abuse and the neglect that happens to children. And some of that money is the corrupt system that's in place. And so how does World Vision work to do those, to do those system strengthening um, activities around um, building the capacity of formal and non-formal actors who have the mandate to protect children? And so as we approach this work, we look at three different key essentials to our program and that we feel as an organization we should focus on. The first one is, no matter where they are, whether it's Syria, whether it's Lebanon, whether it's El Salvador, whether it's Armenia, we feel that children themselves can be empowered. Um, youth adult partnerships and child participation is one of the most important things that you can do. Teach kids how to protect themselves, how to protect their brothers and sisters and their friends, and then mobilize their voices on behalf of changing, bringing about the change that they want to see in their own community. In Bangladesh, we have 50,000 kids involved in youth clubs, and they got behind this whole movement of no brides before 18. And so we mobilized 50,000 kids at the national level to get behind this movement, and laws were changed. So empowering the voices of youth is very important. The second one is strengthening families. The first line of defense, whether you're in the United States or anywhere in the world, the world, is ensuring that parents and caregivers have what they need to protect their own children. The first line of defense. I'm first responsible for making sure that my daughters are safe when they leave the house. Some of that is stranger danger that I equip them with, but some of that is making sure that there's a network of people around that I trust, the babysitter, the school, the teacher, that are there, and so we need to strengthen families and caregivers so that they have the ability to protect their children. Some of this is bringing in economic development opportunities so parents don't have to choose between sending their daughter to a good job in Phnom Penh, that's a waitressing job, that ends up being a working in a brothel job. They don't have to make those decisions because they don't need that income from, their, from sending their child away, and they have the, the means in their, in their own home and own household to take care of that. And the third one, probably the most important one for World Vision, and probably for this group as well, is mobilizing faith communities. And we talked a little bit about that. Steve talked about it in his talk as well. Unique, uh, UNICEF did a, wrote a paper, it was probably 2011, and they talked about the importance of faith communities, not just Christian communities, but Muslim communities as well, uh, the importance of faith communities in protecting children. And so we, as World Vision, have said, and other organizations around us have said, hey, World Vision, you're, you're the faith people. You're the largest faith-based NGO in the world. This is a space that you should, be, you should be leading out in. And so we've taken that challenge, and we're working with faith leaders all over the world. Steve talked about it in chapel today, to really utilize the voices of faith leaders in communities to change the thoughts, behaviors, and attitudes that, that community members have about how they protect their children. FGM in early marriage, female genital mutilation in early marriage, or the machismo attitude in Latin America that is so robbing the lives of so many young children and women, um, that's a cultural, that's a norm that has become a cultural norm in that community. But if the faith text is used to say, you know, are we really treating our youth, our kids, the way that we should be? According to the Bible, according to the Quran, no, we're not. And we found that faith texts often trump, many times trump, cultural norms. And so mobilizing and empowering faith leaders to help change the harmful practices and some of the harmful, um, the harmful practices in communities has really been valuable. So that's our third key essential. Empowering children, strengthening families, and mobilizing faith communities. And so what makes, I'll, I'll close with, what makes World Vision unique in our ability to do these three things. Um, we're child-focused organization. At the core of what we do, whether it's Syria, or whether it's the United States, you know, Minneapolis, or Appalachia, or El Salvador, we're, we're a child-focused organization. So all that we do is to improve the lives and the well-being of children. And we have offices and staff all over the world in 98 countries who are focusing and go to work every day with that focus in mind. Um, 
we, we have the ability to be in relationship with families and children themselves. We're community-based, and that's another strength of world vision. It positions us in this ability, this gives us the ability to build trust with families as it relates to them developing and protecting and educating their children. And so that's the second strength of ours. And then the third strength of ours is because of our size, yet our ability to be in communities, we have the ability to influence change in communities and in countries from the top level where we can connect with national governments and ministries of education and health, but also at the community level where we know, we know kids' names, we know children's names, we're in relationship with families. And so we can help to inform policies and then ensure that they trickle all the way down through all the different levels, all the way down to the community. So it's not an unfunded mandate. I mentioned earlier yesterday that, I mentioned yesterday that a lot of the child protection policies and education policies that you may see at a national government, they're on unfunded mandates. They say, yes, every child will have free education, but we know when we get to the village in Africa, kids are having to pay to go to school. And if they can't afford, they can't go. So how do you deal with unfunded mandates that protect children and make sure that they're funded at the community level? And so those are the distinctives that bring World Vision into the space of, of child protection. Now as we, we'll, we'll kind of pivot this conversation back to Syria. Um, some of the things that we are doing in Syria, um, all of the things that we're doing in Syria really fall under this framework. Syria is just another context in which we do it. And so over the course of the next few minutes, I'll have the ability to talk a little bit about that. Steve and I will kind of tag team some, some conversations about that. But I will say this, <clears throat> in fragile states, whether it's our response to Syria, which is taking place in Iraq, in Turkey, in Jordan, in Lebanon, the collar countries, or whether it's Nepal and the earthquake response, or Haiti and the earthquake response, one of the first things we do is a child protection intervention. Uh, there's a lot of things happening at that same time, but World Vision staff are coming in, and literally after the dust settles, or after the gunfire is over, we're looking for unaccompanied minors. Why? Because we know that there are people who are waiting to find that child who's wandering in the streets, one shoe off, one shoe on, looking for mom and dad, and can't find them. And it's those children who are at risk of being picked up and trafficked. Um, in Nepal specifically, we got calls from Nepal and India who were saying, we were having a lot of Nepalese children being trafficked into India, and we really need to do a child protection binational project to prevent this. And so one of the most important things that we do is a child protection intervention first. And it just anchors us to our core belief that children are where we need to focus. And the vulnerability of children, if we're not addressing that, millions of children are gonna lose their childhood. And so I hope to dialogue a little bit more about this as we move on, and thank you for your time. We really wanted this to be, uh, by the way, that was awesome. Um, every time he speaks, I learn stuff. So as I like, keep going, keep going. Um, we want this to be interactive. And, and the great thing, if you've been here before, after we've had the privilege of, of talking in chapel, is just to open it up. It's also free pizza, which is also really nice. And thank you for those of you who provided the pizza and the, the salad and such. I did see that there were plenty of cookies left over. So all that to state, uh, we would love this to be an interactive kind of open air time in which if you've got questions um, on anything that you've heard, if you were there yesterday and literally last night's sleep, you went, man, I wish I had asked that or I wish I could check in on that. I see some uh, faces from yesterday. Uh, this would be a good time to just have that interaction and we would love to be a resource to you. Again, uh, you would say, well, why are you coming to the seminary? Because we actually believe that the church is the indispensable partner here. Uh, we think the church has a lot to say and a lot to do with reference to a situation like the Syrian refugee crisis. So I wouldn't blow in smoke over in chapel. If the church doesn't show up on this one, what have you been praying about? I mean, if you're, an interna if you're praying internationally for the world, if you really believe that God loves the world and this one's not important, then I just have to ask some questions. I'm not asking whether you're a Christian or not. That's up to God. I'm just saying you're acting like a Christian or not is, is up for debate. It is up for debate, because this one's like really serious, and this one's like boldly right in our face, and this one's like being kind of ushered on a platter to us in terms of people in need. And so if we can just turn a blind eye to this and go, no, I really, I, I have other things. What are your other things? I mean, I just need to know your, I, I don't need to know, but maybe in your prayer time, check out your level of priority on other things. I don't know. Now, again, this is 
This is just Steve being kind of Steve, right? Uh, asking questions. I, I asked myself, and I had to ask myself to the tune of two years ago, literally grabbing some folks with me to just say, am I hearing this right? And so walking through Lebanon and into the Becca Valley with some people you would know, Cameron Strang of Relevant Media. Some of you guys take Relevant Magazine. We took him. We took uh, Adam Jeske, the social media guy for InterVarsity, and Michael Ware from the White House. And we just walked through, and we just said, and we kept going like this. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? I mean, like, pinch me really hard. It, is this going on now? And then you, because you'd hear stats. That's why we went. We heard stats. But these stats can't be true. They're too big. I would know about this. Why don't I know about this? So that's kind of where I, I just give you personal. That's where I'm coming from. It's like, whoa, scream like crazy wherever you go. Do things that are inappropriate sometimes. Break some china is what I call it. Break some china. Because we're having a garden party. While this whole situation is going on and we don't really want to pay attention to it because it's got all these little elements that kind of make us feel squeamish. And I think it's fear, but I also think it's Muslims. Again, the M word. It's military. It's governments. It's political. And we don't do political. Political is people. So maybe we do political, but we do it in a way of Jesus. So what does that mean? So again, if that isn't provocative enough to kind of get us started, I don't know what is. So um, I would love to open it up to some questions that you might have. Yeah, over on the side. And why don't you, why don't we do this? Um, I know this is on camera. You, oh, there's a mic, roving mic. Look at that. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you for sharing in chapel this morning. Um, I had a question, kind of a follow-up to that. How do we get our congregations involved in this, um, whether... It's just a lack of knowledge or even more so like a fear of, you know, refugees maybe coming to where we live or just a fear of the whole idea in general. How do we get our congregations to be a part of this as well? Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. And again, if those of you have heard me speak before know that I'm sometimes uh, I could probably give an answer, but then it's not as good as you giving an answer because then it's your answer, right? I mean, if, if, if you're waking up for this for the first time and you've got and I'm not saying you do, but let's say you had some base level of fear. Uh, terrorism is very real. You saw 9-11, you're seeing some of these other atrocities that are happening, the beheading of Christians, the Egyptian workers, um, and, and yet you're taking care of youth ministry or you're an associate pastor at a local church or what have you. What do you need to, to make a move? What would you need to see to make a move? I think one of the first things would just be some sort of, well, you obviously start with prayer, like you said, but then take some sort of action, even in a small way, to interact with the issue, because then it opens it up to people more, um, and then they're, they're interacting with it, so that fear um, maybe starts to subside when they see, oh, this is something we can do, or they have that boldness to continue, so I think uh, that would be one effective way. I think you're the answer. I think, that's a, I think that's a formidable answer, by the way. The only thing I would add to that is there's probably some facts because so much of our fear is based on really stinking thinking. I mean, really stinking thinking. Uh, we, and we're not helped. Let's just, let's just, can we all admit that? Fear is real. So I would say that. I would say that if you're dealing with a congregation as a pastor, associate pastor, you're given a chance to share with a youth group, et cetera, on any of these subjects, I think we have to admit, I'm scared. There's things that are moving on my watch that I have no control of. It, culturally, I mean, there's a lot of people politically tapping into that one right now, and they're calling themselves Christians. Uh, I'm scared. Things have, are not where they were even a year ago. And when I look at the Middle East, it's not an Arab Spring anymore. It is an Arab deep freeze, and it's not getting better. And the refugees, by the way, just so you know, it was 59 million refugees. That was 10 million more added just last year. It was 49 million last year. So the trend line's like this, and it's not abating. It's not abating. So it's a new world out there. That makes me nervous. It makes me anxious. Someone's moving my cheese, right? 
Someone's moving my cheese. So in the midst of that, I can agree it's scary. And I think you've got to start there. We've got to start with what we got. But I don't live in scary. I don't stay in scary. I don't stay in fear. Why? Because I have been loved and I have a faith that actually tells me that perfect love casts out fear. I have a faith that says I've already died. Mm -hmm. So I've died to self, which means I'm able to allow Christ through me to be a reconciling force. So I can't stay back. I got to lean forward. Okay, now I need facts. So you as a leader within the church need to be giving your congregation facts. That's one of the reasons we do Refugee Sunday, because we've done all this work to give literally any pastor, any leader of a congregation, all the resources they need, videos, sermon points, verses, to literally stand up, stand up and deliver the way you're supposed to deliver. And watch what the congregation does. They will follow. We just sat with, uh, we were sitting in a meeting because we had a big meeting with, we call it, I call it the Evangelical Pope's meeting because you had Rick Warren on video, you had Bill Hybels, you had David Platt, you had uh, Ed Stetzer. I mean, all these people were showing up. Okay, it's probably a bad name for it. But anyway, they were speaking dinner afterwards and some lady who was at Willow Creek, who's an elder, was asked by Bill, what would make you follow into this issue? And she turned to Bill and she said, if you talked about it. Why is that true? She said, because for tw over 20 years, I have watched your leadership, and I trust you. And if you speak about it, I will do it. But if you don't speak about it, I'll take it that this isn't as important in our list of priorities, and I'll do something else. Whoa. The pressure and the importance of a spiritual leader in the community is profound. And so that has to start all with you as a spiritual leader, Get informed, pray, understand the situation, know your congregation, but then at the appropriate time, begin to feed them with the appropriate knowledge and action points such that they can begin to engage. And you'll see some that'll dive into this. They'll look at you and say, where you been? There'll be others that will be fearful and hanging on to everything as you gradually pull them away, you know? But all of that is a, it's a part of a process, isn't it, when we're inside a congregation? Because it all comes in all shapes and sizes. Anything you'd add on that? Well, I would just, <clears throat> so I'd agree with everything you said. Um, and education is important, especially when we, think it, when we think about the things that most people are fearful about. But the Lord has commanded us not to operate in a spirit of fear, right? And so for me, the child protection guy, right, I think about <laughs> whether it's this issue or any other issue that we're dealing with in this space with children, I think about the children. And it sounds really simple just to say that, but I, I'm able to go through this work every day, half the time through tears, and just to be angered by the decisions that adults have made and to see how they're impacting children. So it doesn't matter, like the, the whole issue around why people are fearful, it doesn't, that's not the lens through which I look at this issue. At the end of the day, there's children that are dying. And I don't care if it's children or who are subject of gang violence in Latin America or the Syrian crisis. The issue that the adults have made and sin and evil have created, it's impacting the lives of children. So I clear all that other stuff out and it's like, it's about the kid. It's about the child. And so it sounds really elementary, um, but that's the lens through which I look. It's about child well-being and it's about that kid in that Syrian refugee camp or that that child over here reaching fullness of life and their full potential that God has intended them to reach. So. And I would also just add to that point. If it is about kids, what are we doing about the kids in our churches? This is not an adult, only an adult issue. Now, there are some that would, would say, I'm not one of those protective parents that says, my kids should not know about this. I'm not going to tell them all the X, Y, and Z bottom line of, of how somebody is gutted. No. I'm not going to talk about beheadings of Egyptian workers. No. I am going to talk about a lot of kids, like in the millions, that are being forced to live outside their homes. And they're now living in tents. And they never knew how to live in a tent before. And the tent's really cold in the winter. And they don't have enough food to eat. And some of them are having to work because so they can't go out and play. And they don't have toys. And I'm going to borrow some videos from World Vision to show that identifies those children. So now they're seeing faces. Uh, 
When you do that, you're beginning to wire a kid for the world. It's not, oh, that's a depressing story, therefore they will be depressed. No. If you're actually helping them with appropriate activities that they can begin to do that actually helps solve some things, you're actually wiring them as a citizen of the world. Because, by the way, this is the world they're getting. It's not like trendline, remember? This is the world they're getting. So as a parent or a leader of a church, what are you doing for your promised land? Or is that just an ancillary event in which we do nice stories and Mickey Mouse looking individuals who do nice plays and such, at which time, sometime, high school, junior high, I don't know what the margin, marginal line is, we actually tell them it's a real world out there and it doesn't look like that. I just, I just, church, this is the world we have. I don't have to show you everything, but I should show you something so that we begin to see that these kids need protection and that you as a child have an opportunity to protect. Whew. Now you're talking about a kid who's in their 20s and 30s who thinks church is cool. Because I don't know about those other churches, but I know about my church, when we looked at my world that I'm inheriting, I actually did something. I mean, our church is active. So I, again, I, I, I just, a long answer to a short question, but um, I just think, look at all of the range of people that are inside your church. This is an intergenerational issue with opportunities for us to impact the entire church. Let's do it together. Thank you. Yeah. We met you yesterday. Yes, we met yesterday. It's good to see you again. Good. And thanks to both of you for your time. I really appreciate it. And the, uh, the uh, presentations have been wonderful. So the question here is, is, uh, is, is basically, I, everything I know about this school tells me that you've kicked the right hornet's nest. Is, is that this is a globally minded, mission oriented school. Yes. And I, I think that there are many people here, um, myself included, uh, who may not be satisfied with the uh, spread the word in local church and, and give money because maybe we're not going to local church. Many are going to, to counseling, to missions, et cetera. And I, I do believe there's a, a voltage here to, to respond to, to the, the, uh, the potential you, you've brought us into contact with. So, so complete the loop for us. Okay. Uh, what sort of positions, opportunities, uh, uh, things can we do? Uh, what does World Vision have in, in, you know, maybe not Syria, I know that's limited, but Germany, Greece, is there counseling, is there teaching? What can we do if we're one of those who's, who's feeling the call to go? Well, World Vision is an international family of about 45, 46,000 staff. You got everything from Egyptian agronomists to uh, Turkish uh, water mitigation experts to uh, hydrologists, to agronomists, to uh, accountants, marketing people. I mean, so all the range of professional stuff that you've got, we have that um, because it's, it's how we meet need. Uh, depending on which country, those different you know, sectors are needed. So in America, we're predominantly a resource raising organization. We do have a US programs, which uh, Rasan could talk so much more eloquently about, which actually does kind of the work of mission ministry inside our own country. But most of the folks at World Vision US are business people, you know, they're, they're following how accounting and program development and those kinds of things. Most of the field work is field work. So it's social workers, et cetera. So if you come, if you're coming into this space and either you as American want to work internationally or you're an international coming to work in a space and looking to go back with a theological degree, who knows, but you could be a Christian, you could be on our Christian witness team, you, if you have special uh, you know, abilities with some of these other things from uh, business, executive business uh, leadership, uh, handling of money, uh, uh, program development, social work, et cetera, there's opportunities. You'd actually be hired by the national office there because every national office we have has their own board of directors they're all independent, in essence, entities, all joined together by a common mission and vision. So those kinds of jobs are there. Um, and we work with a lot of partners. So it's not necessarily World Vision might be the purveyor of the, the mission idea. We're going to deliver this much. But we have all sorts of uh, community-based organizations as well as government organizations that we often partner with. So maybe it's a connection there. Those of you who are coming in as internationals, you actually have a foot up on a lot of this. 
because you already enculturized, you already have the language. I mean, you're going back home in a sense, and so you make for unbelievable employees, uh, and many have been hired who have come out of the United States, but they were Egyptian, or they were Lebanese, or they were, uh, you know, from Korea. Uh, again, they got an education here, but they were going back to their own home country where we happen to have an office, and we're in about 100 countries now, so that's a distinct possibility. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We're full of long answers today. Sorry about that. Some of you are going, boy, that, these guys just drone on, so... Thanks so much for both of you being with us. Um, it seems to me it's possible that we could respond in all the ways you talked about, Steve, in the chapel, get rid of our fears, the church around the world responding positively, and yet we've still not dealt with the core issue, the systemic issue uh, of an evil regime of Assad with another evil regime that's even more evil uh, trying to uh, explode the country apart. And so what do, what do Christians have to say in the midst of that, I, I guess is my question. And I mean, it gets very, very complex. It's easy to become very pessimistic in the middle of that. We've had, as uh, the United States, a kind of mixed reaction over the years to Assad. It's been a love-hate relationship, probably a very muddled kind of relationship. Uh, obviously, we know what ISIS is doing, uh, destroying the infrastructure, uh, destroying uh, antiquities that are thousands of years old, I mean, really destroying the soul of the country. And the other options don't look very promising. I, I was speaking at a pastor's conference a couple of years ago, an international conference, and there was a pastor there from Syria. And he said the Christian church in Syria largely was supporting Assad because it was the least of the evils, yeah. is the way he framed it. And he actually had been rather kind to Christians. Christians had a fair amount of freedom. So I'm, I'm saying that's the complexity of the reality. And uh, I teach ethics, and I'm always talking to students about complexity in the mess of life. So I'm interested in your perspective on that. I mean, what... What kind of hope do you give that gets to the core of what really is causing the chaos in the first place? It's, it's funny because you're asking the quote unquote political question, uh, which you know, I'm often told in messaging guidelines that are actually delivered by our organization puts out messaging guidelines. You can talk about this. You're not to talk about this. Do never, we never want to see your name associated with comments that look like this on the internet, right? For good reason. We've got a lot of work in a lot of parts of the world, and if you mess up on this one right here and create a hue and cry, then it actually creates distension on these other things that we're pledged to also raise for. Uh, that's a problem. So on this one, it's always the, the little word that says, stay non-political. You asked a political question. I won't ask you to turn the camera off. I will say this. Right now, I'm... I'm uh, talking pretty heavily with our leadership and that we're rescuing babies. We're rescuing a lot of babies, 2.3 babies. Um, and we're gonna keep rescuing babies because those are the ones that are being thrown into the water. These are the refugees. If we're gonna follow that analogy, these are the refugees that are just being thrown into the water. And many of them jumping into the water because of what's going on. They can't stay on the land. So they're, they're just literally, they're diving, right? I mean, why would you get into a rickety, boat that's over full and uh, you can't swim. I mean, just that, that one is just still a one I just have not been able to find an answer for unless it is so bad where you're coming from. Um, yet as an organization, uh, and this would be self-critical, I don't know if we've done enough to say stop. And I don't think we as a church have even said that. I mean, name the church leader that's literally come out to the pulpit and said, everybody, stop the Syrian crisis. Now, stop it. Look what you're doing to children. Look what you're doing to moms and dads. Look what you're doing to families. I don't care who you are, Bashar Assad, the rebels, the PKK, the Kurds. I mean, we could go through all the list, right? And it's a long list. Stop. Just stop. I haven't heard the world say that. 
And so I'm kind of thinking, okay, World Vision, you're in almost 100 countries. What if just a wave of just your offices rallied whoever was within earshot, and we just started this global movement, and we went, stop! And again, if we get into that, we're going to stop Bashar al-Assad. We're going to stop Daesh, ISIS, ISIL. We're going to stop the rebels. As soon as you stop trying to stop one, the other one feels aggrandized, you're aggrandized, you know, then it's, it's, it's like this. It never stops. But if the whole world, literally the world, said, I'm doing these other things, I'm involved here, I've got these kind of interests, these priorities, etc. But one thing I do, I tell leaders of Syria, leaders of these other countries that are playing games in this one, really dangerous terror games inside this one, who are bombing when they shouldn't be bombing, and they're bombing hospitals, stop! Stop! Now! And it's not a Muslim thing, it's not a Christian thing. The Muslims, by the way, will flock to your churches. Wow, Christians, they're a minority faith. They're like the Yazidis, and, and they're the ones standing up and saying, stop? Why? Because we care about you. We love you. You don't deserve to be bombed. No one deserves to be bombed. No child deserves to see what these children are seeing. And so we're just saying, we're going to come alongside you and say, stop. As I say this, is there not something inside each one of you that just starts rattling? Like, whoa, yeah. Because if you're not doing that, then what are you doing? We're rescuing babies. And in some sense, on a very, although this is not true for us, the most crass amongst us might say, you're raising resources on the back of people who are hurting, but you're not doing anything to stop the thing that's making them hurt. So this is job security for you, misery of people. Not on my watch. If we're going to get involved in this, then we're also going to say stop. And so what if the church, you want to talk about practical? What if the church globally said we're going to be involved in a lot of other things? It doesn't mean that black lives don't matter. It doesn't mean that, that uh, situations in Nepal with children being trafficked doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean, but on this one thing, we're all going to get together because it's a big thing. And we're just going to say stop, stop. I don't give you Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, you know, historic. I, I don't care what it is. Stop. Evangelical, Pentecostal, I don't care. Stop. What if? I'm going to say this tonight. I'll say this tonight. What if we just said that? What would happen? Yeah, I know. Nothing, it's not, nothing would happen. Come on, Steve. It's just a bunch of people talking. Really? I'm not so sure. This one keeps coming. This one is one of those God prompts that just keeps rattling me, waking me up at night. And just says, what if the church just said stop and did everything in its power to just say, calm, calm down, stop, stop. Our leaders were leaders from Rwanda. Can you imagine? Rwanda. They killed their neighbors, you know, 800,000 in 100 days. What if the church of Rwanda was like one of the leaders? Stop. We know what this does. Stop. I actually believe in a, in a very short amount of time this would stop. You got any better ideas? The political idea has not worked for four and a half, five years. How long do you think this most recent peace thing is going to last? I don't have much hope for it. But what if we exercised our faith? And we said, God, okay, God, we're doing what you told us to do. The Holy Spirit's going to have to take over. So again, that's my crazy, that's crazy answer. Great question, serious question, political question. Spiritual answer <laughs> to political question. Can I, can I ask kind of a follow-up, maybe almost equally political question, but, um, and I'm, af I'm afraid of asking that question, but... Um, I guess my, I'm curious about, practically speaking, what does that look like when so many of our evangelical churches are divided and there are many who are sitting back and kind of saying, well, like, yeah, it's a tragedy, but like, it's not my problem. Um, okay, I'm just going to put one on you. Do you have children? No. Someday will you, do you think you might have children? Probably. Let's say that those children are out in the street. And a car is coming? 
What is your typical response? Well, I would go out into the street if some of the neighbors kind of were willing to go out in the street too, but I don't see them moving very quickly. So I'll wait until the children are hit. You would never do that because you wouldn't be a good parent. You would, run, you would move because you'd be motivated by your love for your children. So then the question I have is, do you love Syrian children? If you love Syrian children, then you will operate as a biblical citizen, as a Jesus follower. And it really doesn't matter what your neighbors say, what the rest of the church says. And my guess is by the strength of your leadership, your neighbors will actually come out in the street with you. Oh, are you okay? Hey, wow. When I saw you move, I moved. Right now, every place I go, anytime I'm speaking about the Syrian crisis, there are people who live, some, this happened down in Montecito. This happened at Laguna. These would be bastions of Christian conservatism. And I've had people come up before I speak, and they go, okay, uh, world vision, I, kind of where are you going with this? I mean, like, what are you going to tell us to do? Like, come on, man, you won't take, you know, you want, you want some of this? And then you just talk, and you just come, bring it out of the Bible. And at the end, these are the same people who come up and go, whoa, I had no idea, I am, I, whoa, sorry. I'm changing my attitude. I'm changing my way. And all it took was, I'm one person. It's just one voice, but it's a biblical voice. Hopefully, you check me. Be a Berean. Am I speaking biblically? And if I am, bring it. Because my job is, as a follower of Jesus is to be operating in the truth. And if I'm doing that, then don't be surprised if I'm going to have opposition. We were told that would happen. But also be open for reconciled voices and minds and hearts in which people then come alongside. So it's always in love. Don't fight war with war. Fight war with peace. Fight war with love. But always come with the truth. And then as I do that, keep my hands open. And people will, people will grab. And then that's how movements are started. That's HIV, the, the battle with HIV, around HIV. We were the most stigmatizing force of all time, the church. I mean, we were the ones that were saying, if you had that virus in my church, get out of here. We don't want you in here. We don't like your kind in here. And then what happened? People started informing people as to what HIV was. There's a difference between a person and the virus. And when that happened, love overfilled. And people swarmed the church because finally they've got someone who will hear them and listen to them and walk with them and heal them. And then this, do we ever hear those conversations of stigma anymore? No. So I, I, I actually believe this is, a, this is a time for us, to those of us who have that information, to stand up. You want to add well, something? I was just going to add, it's, it's the exact same way that we mobilize the church globally. Uh, as an organization, we have a tool and approach called Channels of Hope, right? We have one that's specific to HIV and AIDS. We have one that's specific to gender issues. We have one that's specific to child protection issues, and we're developing one that's specific to the issue of disability. And so when we've decided that mobilizing faith communities to bring about attitude and behavior change is a key intervention, then that's what we do. So you educate, you educate the faith community, specifically faith leaders, on the real issue, that, that HIV and AIDS is not about a curse that the family had, or a child with a disability is not because that family's cursed, but you educate first, and then you mobilize them to, to begin to think about, through their faith text, what is our faith text telling us to do with this group of people? And through their faith text, changing their thoughts, changing their attitudes, changing their, that's really what it is. Thoughts change attitudes, attitudes change behaviors, right? And so that's the tool we use across the world in any context where we're saying we need to mobilize the faith community. We could do that. We could use the same principles in the United States with any issue we want to face, especially this issue. So. That's good. That's good. Uh, we have one more question. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, actually, I have a, a little bit of response and one more question. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Because uh, yeah, sorry. So I sense lots of uh, American uh, church. Uh, church. You represent American church here. I have a uh, respons response about the situation. Uh, I came in from China. And usually we are underground church. In underground, what that means uh, we are not open. So in other ways, we don't participate in to too much like a, a social care or social event. 
as the situation changed in 2008, when the earthquake, the big earthquake happened in Sichuan, and uh, at that time, and the house church or underground church realized there's a, a responsibility for them, and uh, almost all of us, uh, the China church coming from all the China, and uh, they went to Sichuan and to do relief ministry there. But also in certain ways, I think, uh, I mean, up to now, when we have uh, some, uh, some conclusion or some idea from that ministry, uh, it's good for us to jump into this ministry. But sometimes it's also bring lots of problems when we are not so that well prepared in certain ways. In biblical, and uh, so it's not something just we just jump into it. Uh, like, uh, so my question is, uh, when it's more complex for us to do this ministry in the real situation, biblically, ethically, and uh, practically, uh, one of my friends set up a, a primary school in Golden Triangle in Thailand, Myanmar in that area. So he faced lots of uh, ethical problems. Like he had to smuggle into that area to provide the, the policemen, especially in the Myanmar sen uh, uh, side. And uh, the most uh, uh, difficult part coming from the warlord in that area, they, they tried to ask them for money for something else. So my question is for you is, uh, what kind of a uh, difficult situation was challenging? For you, when you are in this this kind of a refugee ministry, especially like concerning about ethics and uh, uh, political or something like that, the issues for us are are pretty basic. Um, you've got the. I'll, I'll just, uh, we were talking a lot about Lebanon, so I'll just stay on Lebanon for a second. You got four million people, and you've got 1.7 million that have come in in the last four years. I don't think we have any idea of what that would be like. Just take half, almost half of the United States, and pour that back into the United States. It's 171 million people, by the way. Just poured right back into the United States. How do you handle what? What do you? It's not 171. It's uh, yeah, it's about 171 million. How do you? What do you do with that? So you've got huge infrastructural problems. So we deal with infrastructures, but in this infrastructural problem, you've got the people who are accepting these folks who really don't want them. They would rather them not, this is ruining their country that's on the rise, Lebanon's on the rise. So, so much of our, our, our issues are pretty basic. It's meeting with constabulatories, municipalities, it's trying to help good neighbors to begin to work together because, you, and you've got, people littered on farm fields that were supposed to be farm fields for other Arab nations, but now the farmers have given up the farming because they can rent it out for exorbitant prices. And so you got price gouging and black market starting. And so we're working with, you can imagine all the levels of government, all the levels of business, so that these people don't end up fighting each other. So, our, and again, I, I laugh because I go, welcome to missions work. I call it missions for big people. I mean, this is kind of where we're going as the church. I said this yesterday. I really believe this. One of the reasons we're working so hard on best practices on this particular disaster is this is the where, where the world is going. And so if we don't learn here, then what are we going to do when complex human emergencies just like this spring up and you just name the hotspot, which could be another Syria? And extremist faith is on the rise. And I got to tell you, so many of those who are on the receiving end of the extremist faith are looking for something different. They want something that actually tends to tenderizing you toward your neighbor, where you actually feel loved, where the hole in your heart is actually full. So I keep going, man, if this was ever a time for the church, but it may not begin with you coming in with the four spiritual laws, because that has no authenticity or integrity to the group you're coming in with. They want to know, do you actually care that I am starving, that I am freezing, 
and that my kids have seen things kids should not have seen. And I'm a dad, and I'm a mom. So those are the issues we're dealing with on that kind of, I would call it very, very base level. And we're pretty much limited by the number of resources that we have. And that's in terms of staff, as well as you know just basic resources. In order to put in clean water wells, it takes money. And that's another question that was asked yesterday. What about all the money? I mean, is it all that we can give is money? Right now, money is like king. Cash is king. Because we're still dealing with, in many ways, a relief situation, even though this has been going on for four years. It's a relief situation in slow motion. Category three in slow motion. We're just not in a position yet where we can do development. Uh, that time, we hope, almost never comes because if we're doing development, it means they stayed. We really do want the Syrians to be able to go back to their home countries. That's what they want. That's what we want. Uh, but we're still caught up in relief. But it's, can you imagine relief for four years? Because the country doesn't want you there, and you don't want to be there. But you have to be here because you may never be able to go home. Even though you carry your home key, that's the bizarre part. These people walk around with the keys in their pocket. Four years ago, their home opened up with that key. And their belief is someday they will be able to go home to Aleppo, to Damascus, and they'll be able to put their key in the door and go inside. And they carry it there. So every time their hand goes in their pocket, they're feeling their keys to their own home. How's that for you? Do they want to come to the United States? No. No. That would be last resort. I want to go home. So what are we doing to help them kind of make home home here, but very much with the idea that they're going to go there someday? That's pretty basic, right? That's pretty basic. Yeah, just on a practical sense, I can tell you about some of the stuff we're doing. If I'm understanding your question, right, what are some of the challenges we're seeing as we're, so we're in the process of designing a project, probably going to be a four to $5 million project with both Lebanon and Jordan in the education space. Um, if you might have heard, the average length of time that most of, most of the refugees are refugees are anywhere between 15 and 17 years. And so what's happening is the kids aren't going to school. So if you take your kid out of school for 15 years at the age of four, and then they don't, they don't get education until they're 19, what's that mean? So we're really focusing on um, education, re 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 again, returning childhood to children and bringing them into school. The problem that we're having is Lebanon and Jordan have both brought Syrians into their school. And initially, Lebanon was schooling Syrian children with their Lebanese children, and Jordan was kind of schooling them and giving good quality, but it was kind of separate. So we're working with two different contexts there. The problem that we have is there is relief going on because we have Syrian relief happening, but there's also the deterioration of the Lebanese and the Jordanian structures because they're at capacity and not over capacity. So even as we design a project that's gonna, and, and Lebanon said, can we focus on the education of Syrian, Palestinian, Jordanian, and Lebanese children? We said, absolutely, that's what we would prefer you do. The problem is, um, designing those interventions so that they're meeting the needs of Lebanese children, but also meeting the needs of Syrian children, so that's difficult. The other thing that we've heard from them is, while we prefer to, we, we prefer to do a long-term, four to five year project, what we're hearing from these national offices is, the, sh the sands are shifting beneath our feet. The Ministry of Education could decide, decide tomorrow that they're gonna shift their policy on what we're doing with Syrian children. So we can't do long-term projects that have a donor promise at the end or have a long narrative that you're gonna tell your door stories. They appreciate the fact that we're looking for their sustained work, that it's not just respond to the need now, but help us bridge the gap over the next four years. But they said, we could, we could hear something tomorrow that changes everything that we feel is right to do right now. And so that's one of the challenges that we face in, as we're working with specific interventions that go a little deeper and a little more specific than just our Syrian response. You know, in, in the work that I lead, we're, we're designing specific projects around goals, around goals around child protection education. And as you're designing that logical framework, what we would call a project log frame for that work, we have difficulties in knowing where things will be in eight months or in 12 months and working with national office folks who really know the context today. So that's one of the challenges we're facing.